Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture. A special treat in store for you today, those of you who have come to Mazur and those who are listening in countless numbers on the video cast, because we're going to hear about genes, lifestyle, and risk for heart attack from the person who I think I would most want to give that lecture because of the way in which his own research has illuminated those issues in ways that <clears throat> I'm not sure I would have imagined possible uh, a decade ago. Uh, Seth Katharisen, our speaker, is director of the Center for Genomic Medicine at Mass General. He's also director of the Cardiovascular Disease Initiative at the Broad Institute and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. But that's only true until the middle of July, when in a, um, a somewhat unexpected, and one might even say bold move, uh, Sake has announced he will become the CEO of a new company called Verve, which has as its goal the application of in vivo gene editing to irreversibly and permanently cure cardiovascular disease by a somatic approach. Uh, this is pretty exciting stuff. All of us who are pretty jazzed about gene editing for things that are caused by single gene mutations, <clears throat> like sickle cell disease, which we certainly have talked about a lot uh, in this institution, have been sort of looking for an opportunity to see this applied to polygenic common disease. And that's very much uh, the vision uh, that Sake is going to pursue in his new role uh, in this company coming up uh, very shortly. And it sounds exciting indeed. I had the chance to hear a little bit more about it speaking to him earlier today. Uh, he is uh, somebody who has a uh, distinguished academic record, undergraduate at University of Pennsylvania, bachelor's in history. There must be a story about that. And then went on uh, to become, uh, a, to receive his MD degree at Harvard, following which he was a postdoc uh, with Chris O'Donnell working on the Framingham study. And then after that at the Broad with David Altshuler in the general area of human genetics, but very much carving out the space of the genetics of human cardiovascular disease, where he has become uh, an international leader. Uh, he went rapidly through the academic ranks to his current role as professor. And along the way, uh, received a number of important prizes. I will particularly mention the Kurt Stein Award from the American Society of Human Genetics, uh, the Joseph Vita Award from the American Heart Association, uh, as well as the Martin Prize for Basic Research uh, from Mass General. Happy to say that much of his work has been funded by NIH, so we take total credit for all of it. And uh, the work that he has done touched on many different areas, but perhaps you will know him best for the leading role that he has played in introducing the concept of the polygenic risk score, which has made it possible to take the very complex genetics of common diseases like cardiovascular disease and diabetes and move that into an area of real opportunity for preventive medicine in a precision medicine kind of way. So if you want to hear about cardiovascular precision medicine, you've come to the right place. Please join me in welcoming to the podium uh, Dr. Saik Katharisen. Thank you so much, um, Francis, for the very, very kind introduction. Uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be here to speak to you all today. Uh, I actually do count myself among the the legions of individuals who've actually been inspired to enter science and, uh, you know, through, the, through an experience at the NIH. I was uh, here, actually, in the summer of 1993, uh, after my first year of medical school at Harvard, uh, working with Alan Romali in the molecular cardiology branch uh, that was, at that time, I think, led by Jeff Haig, um, and I had a terrific experience uh, uh, and really has, uh, did inspire me to kind of stay uh, in, in science, and particularly as a physician scientist. So for that, I'm grateful. And, and of course, uh, all the, the funding over the years uh, from this, this place in terms of enabling our work as well. So it's great to be here. Uh, let me jump right in. Um, here is uh, my, my, my disclosure. Here are my disclosures. Um, in terms of uh, acknowledgments, I want to thank members of my research laboratory shown uh, on the left, as well as Stacy Gabriel at the Broad Institute and collaborators from all over the world who've enabled uh, the studies I'm going to describe. Our science has been inspired by patients, uh, patients like this one. 
This is an actual 911 call uh, for a 42-year-old gentleman who presented with dizziness and profuse sweating. And what's highlighted is the, uh, the actual ambulance sheet. Uh, what, said, what you can read is that the stretcher was brought into the residence and the patient was getting ready for transfer from the chair to the stretcher when he started posturing and having a seizure. The patient was transported into the ambulance. And once inside the ambulance, the first rhythm that was observed is shown here. And this is, of course, ventricular fibrillation. The patient was resuscitated, shocked out of this rhythm into the rhythm shown below. And here in this ECG, there are signs of an acute heart attack involving the right coronary artery. The patient was uh, successfully taken uh, to the hospital, had an interventional cardiology procedure, had a stent placed in the right coronary artery, but unfortunately had suffered a fair amount of anoxic brain injury during the resuscitation period at home and died 10 days into the hospital course. So a 42-year-old gentleman with a fatal MI, and here were the MI risk factors during a visit to the doctor six months earlier. What you can see is that the LDL, cholesterol, the lipid risk factors, LDL is a little high, the HDL is a little low, the triglycerides are a little high, the non-lipid risk factors do not stand out, but he has a very strong family history. Here he is, father with early disease, as well as an uncle who died at the age of 42 as well, and um, paternal grandmother with early MI as well. So strong family history. Now, when a patient like this is seen in the, in, in the clinic nowadays, we're asked to calculate a 10-year risk for having a heart problem using a global risk calculator. The calculator used in the United States is sponsored by the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. This is a 10-year calculator for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. If you put this patient's numbers into the risk calculator, you end up getting a 1.7% 10-year risk of having a problem. And that's categorized as low risk, but clearly this patient was not low risk, had died six months later. So this kind of speaks to some of the limitations of the current approach to global risk scoring. So the patient highlights a general issue that we've addressed, which is what is the inherited basis for myocardial infarction. And we've looked at this problem from two different lenses, two distinct lenses. So here's the population at large, the genome, and average risk of myocardial infarction. A given individual may harbor a genetic factor that may increase their risk for disease. So the question here is, what's the genetic basis for risk? Alternatively, that same factor might actually protect against disease. And so what's the genetic basis for resistance? And so these are the two issues that I'm going to highlight um, uh, in the next 40 minutes or so. So to get everybody up to speed on the disease process, we've studied myocardial infarction, or more commonly known as heart attack. This is a disease of the wall of the arteries that run on the surface of the heart. There are three major branches. This is a cross-section of that artery, and the disease has two phases. The first phase is a chronic phase, several decades. There's buildup of atherosclerotic plaque in the wall of the artery. And then there's an acute phase where there's basically a tear, a rupture of the endothelial lining on the inner wall of the artery, that rupture exposes the flowing blood to subendothelial collagen, which is a potent trigger for blood clotting, thrombosis. So at a given time point, there could be a blood clot that superimposes on top of the atherosclerotic plaque, essentially blocking the flowing blood from going downstream. If that blood clot stops blood flow for more than 20 minutes, then the part of the heart that's served by that artery can die that death of heart tissue, or myocardial necrosis, is a heart attack. And that can be detected by symptoms, EKG change, and elevation in blood protein levels. This disease, like many of the diseases that we all study, is a classic complex trait. It has both the heritable component as well as lifestyle components. And for about half of all myocardial infarction, the first presentation is fatal, like the patient I presented. Now, the best understood risk factors for um, uh, heart attack are lipoproteins, schematized here. Shown here are um, uh, uh, different lipoproteins. They're typically spherical particles with a phospholipid monolayer, 
and then a um, lipid in the center, a neutral lipid in the center. And the lipid can either be triglycerol or triglyceride or cholesterol. And the lipoproteins are named either based on the density, high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, or the lipid that's in the center. These three particles are collectively called triglyceride rich lipoproteins, or TRLs, because they mostly carry triglyceride in the center. Okay, so with that background, let's go to the first question, which is the inherited basis of risk. So to understand this, in 1997, we started enrolling patients who had a heart attack at a young age when I was an intern at Mass General Hospital during internal medicine residency. And we focused on early MI patients because the role of inheritance is larger when disease occurs at a younger age. And we used a cutoff of men less than 50 and women less than 60 in terms of for this recruitment. So over a few years, we recruited several hundred people and then collaborated with people all over the world who had similar collections to get to the results I'm going to describe. So it turns out there are three main genetic paths to MI risk. One is the monogenic model, where a mutation in a single gene is sufficient to lead to early disease. The second is the polygenic model. The additive effect of many variants in aggregate can lead to early disease. And then lastly, somatic mutations. So these are mutations that arise in your, your own body during your adult life that can predispose to disease. And I'm going to take each of these um, models in turn. So the first is the monogenic model. Again, is there a gene where a single mutation can drive the patient to early MI? The experiment here, um, sponsored by the NHLBI sequencing project a few years back, really looked at about 5,000 cases with early MI, so 5,000 individuals like the patient I described, and 5,000 controls, and we were able to sequence every gene in the genome, the protein coding region for all uh, 10,000 individuals. As you know, that's roughly 30 million bases, 180,000 exons, and of the 3 billion in the human genome sequence, roughly 1% codes for protein. The analysis here is relatively straightforward. You're basically comparing the frequency of mutations in cases in a given gene and comparing that frequency to controls, the frequency in controls, with the expectation that most genes in the genome, there will be no difference in frequency of mutations in cases versus controls, but for a few, there will be an excess in cases compared to controls. So we are systematically searching again for risk mutation signal across each of 18,000 genes. And at the end of this kind of analysis, we found there are four main genes that stood out in terms of uh, where mutations in coding sequence had a large effect on MI risk. The genes are shown here. The carrier frequency in the population. Then the blood biomarker that's changed as a result of the mutation. So it's either LDL, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins for these two genes, and then LP little a, kind of a cousin of LDL, uh, for this gene. And then the degree of clinical effect on MI risk, roughly two to fourfold two to five-fold, let's say, increased risk based on whether you carry a mutation or not. Okay, that's the monogenic model. So of the 5,000 individuals in this study with heart attack at a young age, what fraction can you explain, can you find one of these monogenic mutations? This was actually not known prior to our study. And we found that about 4% of the cases carried a monogenic mutation. So that's roughly 200 out of the 5,000 people. So what about everybody else? What about the remaining 4,800? Why did they have a heart attack in their 30s, 40s, or 50s? So this, uh, to explain this, we turn to the polygenic model. And here, the question is, do common DNA polymorphisms contribute to MI risk? The analysis involves cases and controls again, but here, a much larger number, 60,000 cases, 120,000 controls, over about 10 years of, of work, uh, in, in terms of a meta-analysis. And the, the, uh, the genetic analysis here is not sequencing, but genotyping millions of polymorphisms across the genome. And now we're searching for allele frequency differences between cases and controls for a given site in the genome. The unit of analysis in the monogenic analysis that I mentioned earlier is a gene. Here, the unit of analysis is not a gene, but actually site by site, polymorphism by polymorphism. And so the results are displayed here. This is a so-called Manhattan plot. On the x-axis are all the chromosomes. On the y-axis is the strength of statistical evidence uh, for a correlation between genotype and phenotype. And each dot here represents a specific spot in the genome sequence, a polymorphic site. 
All the dots above this genome-wide statistical threshold represent confidence signals of association between genotype and risk for MI, and there are about 95 gene regions that have that property. Now, each of these gene regions, uh, each of these variants, has a very small effect on disease risk, roughly anywhere from 5% increase in risk to maybe 30% increase in risk if you carry the risk flavor. Now, but there are many of them. There are 95 of them. So people have wondered whether maybe you could add these up into a, a polygenic score to understand risk. So does a polygenic model contribute to early MI? So the early efforts focused on the results at the top of the list, let's say the top 95 polymorphisms that I mentioned. And the concept was quite simple. You take n polymorphisms, zero, one, or two copies of the risk flavor, and then a score ranging from zero to two n for each person. That score can be weighted based on each variant's effect size on disease risk. And we and others showed over about you know, the last eight years or so, eight to 10 years, that this approach can work in identifying at-risk individuals. But there was an important conceptual advance proposed um, actually based on work in livestock, animal uh, breeding. Uh, and this is led by Peter Vischer, Naomi Ray, and David Evans back in 2009. They reasoned that actually taking the analysis from the top of the list to actually looking at the full genome worth of common variants may actually be better in terms of risk prediction. And soon after, it was shown that actually heritability of any given trait is explained much better by looking at the full list rather than just the top of the list. And, and, and so there have been algorithms, approaches developed to take advantage of the full set of common polymorphisms to do risk prediction. And that's what we leveraged a couple of, or last year actually, to develop what we call genome-wide polygenic scores where we move from the top SNPs, just looking at the top SNPs here, to really the full breadth of genetic data, a genome-wide set of, in our case, 6.6 .6 million common variants for prediction. So I want to walk you through that data. So the hypothesis here that we started with was that a polygenic score, including a genome-wide set of SNPs, could explain some of those 98% of people who had a heart attack at a young age where we didn't find a monogenic mutation. In fact, we thought that maybe there are a set of people who are getting to monogenic levels of risk using this genetic model rather than a single mutation. So that's what we set out to test. And this work um, is really four steps. The first step is a large genome-wide association study where we have millions of polymorphisms. For each polymorphism, we have a risk flavor and we have an effect size. And that's the training data set. So we have the effect sizes for 6.6 .6 million sites, common variants in the genome. Step two is to use that information to construct scores. And we constructed roughly 23 different scores using four different algorithms and evaluated each score in a validation data set. So this is really what's called out of sample prediction. And this was done in a large prospective cohort called the UK Biobank, which is a half a million people that have been recruited in the UK. Uh, clinical data, uh, they answered questions, blood measurements have been made. We know who has developed a heart attack and who hasn't. Over time, they've been followed on average about eight years. And then they've all been genotyped, and we have all the common variants really openly available, really a model for data access. Um, and we went to that study and looked at the first 125,000 people. There are about 4,000 cases, 120,000 controls. And we applied all 23 scores to pick the best score. One stood out as the best. And that score involved in the inclusion of 6.6 .6 million common variants for prediction. Then we took that score to an independent set of 300,000 people from UK Biobank, about 9,000 cases, 288,000 controls and looked at the performance of that best score in this new set of individuals. And remarkably, the prediction performance was identical in this group compared to this group. So the, I'm going to show you data for that score going forward. First is, what does this score look like in the population? So everybody has a number. And I'm going to show you a plot of that number in 300,000 people. And here it is, a beautiful bell curve. Like many other traits in the population, like height, or cholesterol or blood pressure, if you plotted those traits, this is what it would look like. So we now have a quantitative risk factor for heart attack, really a measure of one's genetic liability to disease. 
Now, this score, a couple of other questions come to mind. How does this score relate, then, to things that we use every day in clinical practice currently to measure risk for heart attack? For example, the cholesterol or blood pressure. And here is the correlation of the genome-wide polygenic score on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association pooled cohorts equation score for a set of individuals from the ERIC study, uh, another study sponsored by the uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And you can see the correlation coefficient is very low, like almost no correlation. So this new metric of genetic liability is capturing something quite orthogonal to the things that we use every day in clinical practice. The other question that comes up is, how much higher risk are individuals based on where they stand in the score distribution? There are a couple of ways to look at this. One way is a very simple analysis, which is on the x-axis, I'm giving you the percentile of score where each person stands in the distribution compared to everybody else. So these are 1% bins of, of polygenic score among the 300,000 people. On the y-axis is for any given bin, what, what's the prevalence of coronary artery disease? How many, what fraction have coronary artery disease in that bin? Now, because this is 300,000 people, each bin is roughly 3,000 individuals. And what you can see is if you're in the top percentile of score, roughly 11% of individuals had coronary artery disease. If you're in the bottom uh, percentile, no one, almost no one had coronary disease. So this is a very remarkable gradient, I think, that you can have in disease prevalence based on a number measurable at birth. So, so we were impressed by this. And then we asked, what about this question of, could you get a set of individuals who um, would be at similar level of risk to monogenic model? So can we identify a group with risk for MI equivalent to monogenic? And so remember, the monogenic component was roughly 1 in 200, 1 in 250, about threefold increased risk for MI in carrier versus non-carrier. So we wanted to do an apples to apples comparison between the two models. So we arbitrarily label the top 5% of the distribution as carrier of a genetic factor and the remainder as the comparison group, basically non-carriers, and said, what's the risk in this group compared to this group? This analysis can be done in many different ways. You could make the reference group just the middle, you can make the reference group toward the end. It doesn't, re it's all the same math. It doesn't change the end result that much. If you, if you um, look at this top group as high, everybody else as, as um, non-carrier, the odds ratio is 3.3. If you look at the top 1% versus everybody else, the odds ratio is closer to five. So there are a set of individuals who are getting to levels of risk similar to monogenic FH, familiar hypercholesterolemia. Another important question that comes up is more details on the risk prediction characteristics. How does it add to traditional risk factors? So I'm showing you here on the x-axis, this is work of Mike Inouye uh, from Australia, again in the UK Biobank. On the x-axis are the individual risk factors that we currently use in clinical practice to predict heart attack risk. On the y-axis is a metric of prediction performance called the C-index. So this is smoking here, this is diabetes, family history, and this labeled meta-GRS, that's, that's a polygenic score, genome-wide polygenic score, it's just a different name used here. What you can see is if you take each individual risk factor in turn, the polygenic score has a prediction characteristic similar to cholesterol or blood pressure individually. In fact, it's, it's a bit better. And then if you think about what about all the conventional risk factors together without the genetics, that is about 0.67 in terms of uh, C-index. Conventional risk factors plus the polygenic score is about 0.7. So again, making this point that this is adding incremental information on top of what we already use in clinical practice. But again, the key difference, I think, between this factor and other things is that it can be measured early in life and has predictive property uh, from then on. Okay, um, now that was all data in UK. What about external validation? What about people in the United States? What about broader ethnicities beyond, um, uh, beyond uh, those in the UK, the European ancestry? So to, do ex to look at the external validation, we, we 
turned to a study in the United States of about 2,000 people with early heart attack, 3,000 controls. And we, in this case, through the support from the National Human Genome Research Institute uh, Centers for Common Disease Genomics Grants, we were able to obtain 30x whole genome sequence in all 7,000 individuals. And um, therefore, we were able to simultaneously look at the contribution of monogenic and polygenic models in the same, in, same set of individuals. And so I'm going to show you these results um, just in pictorial form. So for every 100 patients with early MI in this study, similar to the earlier study that I mentioned, roughly two um, had a monogenic mutation that you could readily see. Because of they had that mutation in the FH gene, they, could, uh, they had about a fourfold increased risk for heart attack. In contrast, almost 17% were basically high polygenic risk. They were in that top 5% of the polygenic score distribution, so really a tenfold higher number of individuals affected by this model compared to the other model, and a similar level of risk compared to the monogenic model. Now, here are the two uh, models in, in contrast. We talked about the prevalence. We talked about the odds ratio as being similar. Now, the mode of detection, how are we finding these people right now? For the monogenic model, we typically are finding them in clinic because of the elevated lipids, because I mentioned they generally increase LDL and or triglycerides. The polygenic model, this is the most important point, I think, of this section of the talk, is they're currently unaware of their risk. They're not being picked up by other biomarkers, because I showed you that it's very poorly correlated with the existing risk scores. And another point is about the mechanism of risk. For monogenic, we know what it is. It's the ApoB-containing lipoproteins. For polygenic, for lack of a better term, it really is a gamish of many, many things in aggregate that's leading to disease. And then a very important point in terms of risk assessment is it's important to find people at risk, but it's probably even more important to be able to offer them interventions that can reduce risk. So for the monogenic model, we know that lifestyle and or medications can make a difference, particularly cholesterol-lowering statin medications. For polygenic, we did not know if that risk was modifiable. We went on to look at this question, and the, the short answer is yes. The risk conferred by the polygenic model is modifiable for MI in, in terms of either lifestyle and or medicines, specifically statin medications. I'm actually, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through, um, actually, let me just do this, uh, the, the lifestyle portion in, uh, quickly. So this is the lifestyle data. In individuals at high polygenic risk, can a favorable lifestyle counterbalance the, the inherited risk? So we did a lifestyle score, very similar to the, um, the polygenic score, uh, except this is just four factors. No smoking, body mass index less than 30, regular physical activity, or a healthy diet pattern and uh, gave people a score, one point for each of these good things. Three or four is a favorable score, a favorable lifestyle, zero or one unfavorable lifestyle, and two is intermediate. Then we looked at the relationship of lifestyle score to the inherited uh, polygenic risk. And here on the x-axis is the genetic risk. This is high polygenic risk. And the y-axis is the event rate in, a, in the, again, the ERIC study. And what you can see is among a set of individuals that are high polygenic risk, we can further sub subdivide them into unfavorable lifestyle, favorable lifestyle, and intermediate. And if you're high polygenic risk and a fa unfavorable lifestyle, the 10-year event rate was 11% in this study. If you're high polygenic risk and a favorable lifestyle, the 10-year event rate was only 5%. So almost a 50% offset in the inherited risk based on uh, being optimal in terms of lifestyle. So DNA was not destiny here, that you do have control over um, this, this genetic risk. Okay, another uh, op option to help patients who may, may have high polygenic risk would be medications, specifically statin medications. So we looked at um, the relationship of, uh, of uh, polygenic risk strata to benefit from statins to prevent a first heart attack from three completed randomized controlled trials of statin therapy where we had access to the DNA of the participants in both arms at baseline. And we evaluated the clinical benefit of statin therapy in high genetic risk group versus all others. And here are the results. Among those who are high genetic risk, the relative risk reduction was 44%. The absolute risk reduction was 8%. In contrast, among everybody else, the relative risk reduction was lower at 24%, and the absolute risk reduction was lower as well at 2.7%. Uh, 
So really, uh, among those at high polygenic risk, statins confer a greater benefit to prevent a first MI than, than all others. So we have basically two options to modify the risk coming from polygenicity. Okay, so what I like to, uh, to, to summarize in terms of the polygenic score work is this is in some sense the first risk factor. It's the soil on which all the other risk factors are kind of uh, planted. And so we can now distill inherited susceptibility to MI coming from common variants into a single number. That number has a Gaussian distribution in the population and it adds incremental value to what we already measure. And I think in a few years, most will know this number similar to the way we know LDL right now. Now, this approach of polygenic risk scoring is it generalizable to other diseases. So we looked at this as well and looked at um, for atrial fibrillation, inflammatory bowel disease, type 2 diabetes, breast cancer. And in each case, there's the percentile uh, on the x-axis, on the prevalence on the y-axis. Each case, there's a set of individuals in the top, let's say, 4 or 5% five, 5 of scores that are extraordinarily high risk for disease compared to everybody else. And it's um, important now to think through what are the interventions, either lifestyle or medicines or, or uh, diagnostic uh, screening that, would, um, that might be applied to these individuals who are at high risk. Okay, in terms of the third path, the somatic mutation path, what we've been focusing on so far are hereditary mutations. So these are mutations you inherit from your parents. But there's another set of mutations that you might acquire during your lifetime, so-called somatic mutations or acquired mutations, that are typically thought of in the context of cancer. Uh, and one of the um, uh, disease, one of the, uh, uh, one of the somatic mutation processes is called clonal hematopoiesis. And so this is really somatic mutations in hematopoietic stem cells. So we all have hematopoietic stem cells in our bone marrow. That, those cells, one of those cells, might requ acquire a mutation during the course of a, an individual's life. And, and, and that, that mutation might give that clone, that cell, a growth advantage. That clone expands and may acquire additional mutations uh, along the way. So this, uh, this clonal hematopoiesis, turns out it's actually detectable by exome sequencing of blood. And Sid Jaswal and Ben Ebert in 2014 showed this is an age-dependent process. On the x-axis is deciles of age, or 10-year uh, uh, windows. On the y-axis is, um, is uh, uh, the frequency of clonal hematopoiesis. So by the time people are in their 70s and 80s, almost 10% of individuals will have one dominant clone. Now, it turns out these mutations are not just scattered at genes, uh, genes all across the genome, but they actually fall in just a few genes. These are the genes, DNMT3A, TET2. Uh, these are all epigenetic driver genes, and they're frequently mutated. And again, the, the, this process can be detectable with sequencing of blood tissue, just uh, 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 whole blood. Now, the presence of somatic mutation upped the risk for hematologic cancer. So that was no surprise, because uh, it's, it's a, a mutation process that's giving the clone a growth advantage. But what was a surprise that Sid found that it also increased risk for incident heart attack, coronary heart disease. So we went on to try to replicate this observation in looking at patients with early heart attack and asking if any of them might have clones. And we found that clonal hematopoiesis was identified in roughly 2% of early MI patients. Quite a surprise because no young person basically should have a clone. But we found about 2% of early MI patients did. And the risk conferred by having a clone compared to not having it was about fourfold, similar to the monogenic and polygenic model. So what's the mechanism? How does having a clone here in increase risk for heart attack? And this is a work in progress, but early evidence suggests that this is basically heightened inflammation, that there's, there's excess inflammation through the IL-1 beta inflammasome pathway, and that's the reason for the accelerated atherosclerosis in these patients who carry clones. This is data where in mice, they're either given wild-type bone marrow or bone marrow from TET2 knockout animals, and TET2 being one of those clonal hematopoiesis genes. And if you give the mice TET2 bone marrow, there's accelerated atherosclerosis compared to giving um, mice uh, wild-type bone marrow. And, and there's, uh, the, inf the inflammasome part of it comes in terms of this kind of evidence where there's excess staining of IL-1 beta and there's heightened uh, inflammasome ac activation. 
So monogenic, polygenic, and somatic. So what does all this mean for the architecture of disease, common complex disease? And so I want to take a minute to give you um, our thoughts on implications of this work for how we think about common disease generally, common complex disease generally. And there are largely two models of common complex disease. Uh, I'm going to call them the fruit salad model and the smoothie model, and uh, very scientific. Um, the fruit salad model is here, that basically it, there are, the colors represent different driving pathways, and that in any given person, there's actually one driving pathway. And our job is to make measurements to resolve a common complex disease like heart attack into these multiple diseases, right? So that's one model. The other model is, is, is this, where in any given person, it's actually a quantitative blend of different driver pathways with relative excess of one flavor versus another. Now, it's pretty clear that there's been a lot of work and hypotheses that, that actually this is really what's going on for common complex disease. And I would say that the genetic data is really suggesting that the, the smoothie model is what's most appropriate to reflect or describe common complex disease. And our job is to really find these driving pathways, these colors, and then understand in, in any given person, do they have a relative excess or versus one or then another, and can we develop therapies against each of these driving pathways? And you might understand that the therapy would have differential benefit you know, in some versus another based on how much that pathway is operative in them but it's not an all or none phenomenon. Okay, let me then move on to the next topic, which is resistance, okay? So uh, what's the genetic basis for resistance? So I'm gonna work through this in the context of lipoproteins, the, the risk factors that I described um, earlier. Now resistance mutations can actually be very helpful to guide the development of new medicines. And so a great example here is LDL. So these are, this is a plot of LDL, HDL triglycerides on the x-axis, y-axis is MI risk. And what you, know, what you know from observational epidemiology, what we know is that higher level of LDL is correlated with increased uh, disease risk. From genetics and therapy, we know that um, LDL is a causal pathway. So there are mutations in several genes that lower the level of LDL lifelong predicting that medicines that mimic those mutations would work in the clinic. And in two cases, ezetimibe and PCS counter antibodies, medicines that have been developed based on these genetic insights actually do work. They lower LDL and they lower risk of disease. Okay? So LDL is an established causal pathway for resistant, low LDL, resistance to heart attack. Okay? Now, what about HDL? high level of HDL is correlated with lower risk of heart attack. So that's why it's called the so-called good cholesterol, right? This would lead to a hypothesis that mutations that raise HDL cholesterol lifelong should actually lower risk of MI, right? Should be protective. So is, is high HDL a protective pathway? So we looked at this from a genetics perspective, a genetic test of the HDL hypothesis. And again, we found a mutation carried by one in 40 individuals in this gene called endothel lipase. As a result of carrying that mutation, these individuals, compared to those who don't carry the mutation, have about 15% higher HDL cholesterol lifelong. Okay, so that should be a good thing if HDL was causal. These individuals who carry the mutation should be protected from heart attack. Okay, so we looked at that. We tested whether the mutation had an association with heart attack. And looking a little over 100,000 people, the individuals who carried the mutation had the same risk of heart attack as those who didn't carry the mutation, despite the fact that they had higher HDL lifelong. The odds ratio for mutation carriers compared to non-carriers was 0.99, so pretty close to one. So this was a real surprise to us, and it took us a while to actually publish this. And um, so what's going on here? So th these are the data, and um, mutation, higher HDL lifelong, but no effect on heart attack. Now, it turns out you could say, well, it's just one way of raising HDL. What about other ways? Well, we looked at several other rare mutations that raise HDL in other genes. Same thing. HDL higher, 
but no effect on a heart attack. We looked at a set of common variants, a polygenic score for high HDL. Same thing, higher HDL, but no risk of, no, no, um, no effect on MI. So these genetic data would actually say that medicines designed to raise HDL cholesterol won't work in the clinic, that they will not lower risk of heart attack. That's what the prediction would be here. So that prediction was, has been tested now by pharmacologic tests of the HDL hypothesis. And here I'm going to show you one, where there's a medicine that inhibits a protein called CTP. Here on the x-axis is 15,000 people. Half of them have been given medicine, half of them not. And on the y-axis is the HDL cholesterol. X-axis is time. And you can see here that if you got the medicine, your HDL was 40% higher compared to those who didn't. But then here were the event curves for the two groups in the randomized controlled trial. Completely superimposable. And not what you want to see at the end of a very expensive RCT. So um, again, this was a very big surprise to the field. The, and it leads to this concept now where the old view is HDL is the good cholesterol. The emerging view that it's a non-causal marker of risk. And so it's still very useful to identify patients at risk, but not useful to target in terms of therapy because it seems to be marking something else, okay? So, um, so if HDL is a non-causal marker, then why is the epidemiology so robust? Why is it in every study high HDL is correlated with lower MI risk? What is it marking? A range of actually possibilities. The one that we've explored most closely is this idea of uh, it's marking the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. As you may know, when you have high HDL, often tracks with low level of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and vice versa. If you have low HDL, you have high level of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. Over the last 30, 40 years, the field has discounted the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins as non-causal, and HDL as causal, largely from observational epidemiology. And, and, but we may have had it backwards for the last 30 or 40 years. And I'm going to show you some evidence why we think that's the case. So the question is, are there more protective pathways beyond low LDL? We just turned away HDL, high LDL. What about low level of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins? Is that protective? So the story I'm going to tell you is about APOC3. This is a gene called apolipoprotein C3 or APOC3. And this story involves the Lancaster Amish. So these are individuals who immigrated to the United States in the 1700s from Switzerland, a few hundred people. And that population has grown to, I think, a couple hundred thousand people in Lancaster County. And, um, and, and it's a founder population in the US. And what Tony Poland from the University of Maryland showed back in 2008 was about one in 20 Amish carried a mutation that broke one copy of APOC3. As a result of having that mutation, individuals had lower triglycerides. We came along and showed that one in 150 in the general population actually carried a null mutation in this gene. They had lower triglycerides, and we were able to add that they had lower risk of clinical events, heart attack as well, really suggesting that, that basically getting rid of a working copy of APOC3 might be good for you in terms of uh, medicine's development. Now, that's great. Heterozygous null, one copy broken, good. But what about, can you find people with both copies gone, so-called homozygous null or knockout? If you could find those individuals and show that they're healthy, Again, it would add even more credence to this target in terms of medicine development because you would presumably give, it would give you confidence in terms of safety of inhibition of this protein. So we looked far and wide for homozygous nulls for APOC3. A couple hundred thousand people in the US didn't find a single person. Then we turned to an important concept in human genetics, consanguinity, where, um, where when, chil when parents are closely related to each other, then the children are more likely to be homozygous at any given site in the genome. And this is a map of consanguinity rates around the world. The darker colors are higher rates. And um, the highest rate of consanguinity in the world is in Pakistan. Roughly 40 to 50% of all marriages involve relationships as close as first cousins. And we had a collaborator that we had been working with for several years from Pakistan, Danish Salahin. Who had collected, uh, who had recruited a bunch of, bunch of like seven or 8,000 people into a research study for a study of genetics of cardiometabolic disease. So we ended up, um, again, through generous funding from NHLBI and NHGRI, we, have, we were able to exome sequence all 7,000 individuals and looked at the relationship of mutation status in this gene to 
blood level of APOC3. This is a circulating protein. On the x-axis are the three genotypes, uh, wild type, heterozygous null, homozygous null. On the y-axis y is blood APOC3. And wouldn't you know it, we found four individuals just in the first 7,000 that were human knockouts for APOC3. They have no circulating APOC3. Okay, so uh, now we have this, these individuals. We wanted to, to un try to understand why they might be protected from heart attack. And there's a fair amount known about APOC3. So it's a, it's a protein that puts a break on your body's ability to clear dietary triglycerides. So it's a kind of a bad actor in some sense. So we wanted to bring um, individuals back from, that had this genotype and maybe do perturbational testing to better understand their physiology. Uh, and so we ended up uh, recruiting this, uh, one of the four individuals here. He's minus minus. He's homozygous null. He, this is the spouse, and nine, they had nine children. And we were shocked to learn that the spouse was also homozygous null, okay? Making all nine children obligate homozygous. So we went from finding nobody, you know, with, in 200,000 people in terms of human knockout for APOC3 to finding 11 just in this one family. And um, we were able to further expand out this family. There are individuals that are of all three genotypes in this family. And then we did a provocative uh, test um, to understand why these null mutation carriers might be protected. The provocative test was um, in individuals without the mutation and with or homozygous null. And the test was a big milkshake. 80 grams of fat, and to try to understand their clearance of dietary fat. We measured blood every hour for six hours after the fat challenge. And here are the data. On the x-axis is time. On the y-axis is blood triglycerides. So this is the wild-type individuals in the family. And um, what happens, presumably in all of us it, in the room, it, is after a fatty meal, the blood triglycerides, blood fat, rises roughly two to three-fold from about 100 to, let's say, 300. This is what happens in the homozygous null individuals. There's basically no postprandial budge in dietary triglycerides. So now, with a lifetime of meals, you can understand why these individuals would be protected. They literally are seeing less fat. The arteries are seeing less fat throughout their lifetime. All right, so these data then suggest that medicines that might mimic the null mutation, so block APOC3, would have an effect on triglycerides. And a couple of companies have developed several approaches, one an antisense oligonucleotide, another a monoclonal antibody, and those medicines now have been given to first in human studies, and they do lower triglycerides, and time will tell whether they also lower risk of MI. So in addition to APOC3, there are two other genes that we have established where null mutations reduce triglycerides and reduce risk of heart attack. And all three of these genes, believe it or not, fall into one pathway. And that pathway involves your body's ability to clear dietary triglycerides, so-called lipolysis. Shown here is the key enzyme, lipoprotein lipase, that basically clears or tri hydrolyzes triacylglycerol from uh, from, uh, from the diet, and the key proteins that actually are endogenous regulators of lipoprotein lipase, APOC3, ANGPTL3, ANGPTL4, in each of these three genes, um, there are null mutations, and as a result of not having a copy, working copy of these genes, of each, any of these genes, individuals have lower level of blood triglycerides, lower risk of heart attack, and medicines are being developed against each of these genes. Um, to mimic the resistance mutations in this pathway. So what we can say is beyond low LDL, uh, lipolysis by triglyceride rich, uh, lipolysis of triglyceride rich lipoproteins by LPL and its regulators is a key protective pathway for MI. Let me close uh, by coming back um, uh, to the patient I, I described earlier. Um, sadly, this is actually the story uh, of my own brother uh, who passed away about seven years ago um, uh, due to this, uh, this terrible disease. And um, I, I really uh, uh, want to ask, um, what can we do uh, to prevent uh, such tragedies in terms of other families? And there are really three um, things uh, that emerge from our work. One is interpret the genome early in life to identify individuals at risk for premature MI. 
Uh, second is deliver proven risk-reducing interventions, lifestyle and or medications uh, to those individuals. And lastly, uh, develop new treatments that mimic uh, naturally occurring uh, resistance mutations. And, and this, this third possibility is what I really uh, hope to accomplish uh, in my new effort. So let me close then here. Uh, what I've tried to talk about is the genetic basis of risk and the genetic basis of resistance. Risk mutations and, and uh, really identify those likely to benefit from early intervention and protected mutations can point the way to causal pathways in new medicines. Thank you very much. So thanks for a terrific presentation. We have time for some questions. There are microphones in the aisles, and please use them so people watching by video can hear the question. I see Dr. Green approaching the microphone. That was terrific. I had a question. You said that um, there were several different approaches or algorithms used for calculating the polygenic risk score, but then one emerged as better than the others. I guess my question is, what were the, in very simple terms, what were the differences between them, yeah. and what makes you think that the one that you're using now is, is the optimal or the best one, that there might not be better methods that would emerge? Yes, I think uh, it's certainly possible that better methods will emerge. This is a very active area of development. I think the key, in this key distinguishing uh, point at this point, at this stage, is should you limit your analysis to the top SNPs or should you go genome-wide? And it's very clear that if you go genome-wide, roughly you get twice as good prediction as if you limit to just the top SNPs. Mm -hmm. And that's because when you go genome-wide, you explain much more of the heritability than if you limit to just the top SNPs. And upper limit of prediction actually is the heritability of the disease. So that's kind of where we are right now. But, it, but the actual algorithms are very active area of development. So you said that there was no real correlation, and you showed a picture of yes. that, uh, between the risk factors we traditionally identify for cardiovascular disease and the polygenic risk score. But you were lumping them all together. I guess I would be surprised if there's not some correlation yeah. with family history and the polygenic risk score. Is there? So it, there's actually not that much of a correlation with family history. So one way to look at this is take the top 5% of score, mm -hmm. take everybody else, and ask what's the fraction of people who self-report family history in the two groups. Okay? So it turns out if you take the top 5% of polygenic score, roughly 37% say they have a family history of heart attack. And if you look at everybody else, it's about 30%. So, so this is capturing something different from family history. And there are a number of reasons why that might be the case. One is actually self-reported family history is quite inaccurate. Mm. You know, everybody thinks somebody in their family had a heart attack, and it's rarely the case. It's actually been objectively shown in the Framingham Heart Study where you have both the parents and the offspring, and you've asked the offspring if they have a family history of heart attack, and you know if the parent did or did not, and there's misclassification roughly 40% of the time. Mm. But the other point, though, you, you, I thought you were going to ask is there... There, it, there has to be some correlation between the score and known risk factors like LDL and so forth. And th there is, actually. And the correlation between the ACC AHA pooled cohorts equation and the polygenic score is very low, 0 0.02. That's because the main driver of the pooled cohorts equation is age. And there's almost no correlation between age and, of course, and genotype. And genotype yeah. Right. So, so that's, that's kind of, you know. So, but if you just took, if you took risk factor by risk factor and looked at the relationship, you'll see something. Okay, makes sense. Over here. Yeah, back in 1992, I published a study in the Archives of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine about uh, very high levels of HDL, where we found people with HDL over 100 milligrams per deciliter in about 40-some uh, people um, at Buffalo General Hospital in New York. And I found when I went through, back in those days, I didn't have, we didn't have money to do things, so we just went through the charts, and we found that they had things like they were perimenopausal females, or they were on anti-epileptic medication, or it was a drunken stupor, or they were exposed to insecticides as the cause. But to make a long story short, most of them didn't have, they showed in their histories that some of them had myocardial infarctions in spite of having this very high level. And there were some, in the literature review, I remember there were some papers that cited familial groups that had high elevated, genetically high HDL, in which they th thought accounted for their increased life expectancy. And apparently you've, de you've debunked all that, uh, but aren't there some 
familial studies that still might support that? And how about people who have genetically low HDL? Would that have an effect on the risk? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have looked at the low, we and actually others uh, before us, anti from um, uh, from Copenhagen. Um, the number one cause of low HDL from a genetics perspective is a gene called ABCA1. And if you're heterozygous null for ABCA1, you have uh, quite, quite low HDL. And, uh, and, and, and we've looked to see whether those individuals are at higher risk for heart attack. And Anne has as well, and they're not. So I think that it's pretty safe to say that the HDL cholesterol, which is what started the whole HDL field, the correlation between HDL cholesterol and risk of disease, that, it is, it is, that it's not a causal path. Okay. Now, there, there's a new hypothesis now where it's not about the cholesterol, but it's about the function of HDL, which is, again, a new hypothesis, and that would need to be tested. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Over here. It was a great talk. So um, I was very intrigued by your smoothie model. So, for example, you very nicely assured that this environment can interact with the genome, the people having, like, this thousands of mutations, harmless mutations, uh, can lead to this kind of problems. But... I was wondering, uh, you showed mostly for the diet. Uh, uh, could, you, could you comment on the role of sleep, uh, time-restricted feeding, uh, which has a lot of benefits on many other like, diseases? So this has been shown in the mice as well as in humans. Yeah. So yes, there's so many important uh, lifestyle factors that clearly interact with genetics uh, to lead to common complex disease. Um, in fact, the majority of risk for, I would say, a heart attack is non-genetic. Huh? And I think a few of those factors have been very well investigated, smoking, uh, physical activity, for example. But there's a lot more, like sleep and others, where the, uh, the, the, it's just getting started. In fact, like the All of Us Research Program or, um, or, or UK Biobank, these very large studies where there's been very nice assessments that have been um, either already done or starting to be done, you know, should help us uh, you know, tease out uh, these lifestyle factors, but also social determinants of health, uh, which is, of course, a key, um, key component for many common complex diseases as well. Over here. I was going to ask you a question related to Dr. Collins's question, because if I understood you correctly, the correlation between the polygenic risk score and the ACCHA prediction is very low. The coefficient is poor but still the added predictive value of the polygenic risk score on top of what we can already predict seemed relatively small. And do you think that's just because, aside from age, it does actually correlate with a lot of the other risk factors that we know about? Yeah, I think it has to do with, um, you know, it's kind of eye of the beholder is what is the important incremental value, you know? So it actually, if you go back to that, it, it all depends on what you start with, okay? So if you start with, you know, if you could, you could actually argue that what we're born with is, you know, what you know initially is the genotypes, age, and gender. If you just look at those three values in a, in a, in a, a predictive model um, and start there, you're going to end up getting to an AUC pretty close to basically here. It's going to be very close to the conventional risk factors. Yeah. So, and you can see individually, if you just look at each individual risk factor, the genetics actually does the best of any of the other ones. So it's all what you start with. Right now, we're not measuring genotype, but you can imagine an era, in fact, actually, we do have the possibility in 20 million people in the United States right now, they already have their genotypes, either through National Geographic, Ancestry, or um, 23andMe, and that's all you need to calculate these scores. So... You know, uh, so, so I think that it all depends on a couple of things. One is what you start with and what you consider to be the appropriate threshold in terms of incremental value. Yeah. Dr. B. Zecker. Yeah, um, th thinking about the genetic architecture overall, how do you conceptualize the polygenic risk score in the context of the monogenic? So when you have both, yeah. What do you have? Do you ignore the PRS when you have the monogenic, or is the PRS a modifier of the monogenic, or how are you thinking about that? Yeah, we're just starting to get data on that. It's a very, it's a question that can be empirically addressed, uh, and it turns out um, it is entirely additive or subtractive. So what we see is that if you carry an FH mutation, 
and you're high polygenic risk, it's like four plus four is eight. But if you carry an FH mutation and you're low polygenic risk, you actually come back down to the baseline level. Hmm. And it's the same for BRCA. So this explains, I think, or can explain a fair bit of the penetrance issue for the monogenic mutation. And no epistasis. No epistasis, just additive. Oh, that's amazing. Yes, here. Maybe the last question. Oh, so one more thing. Time. And lifestyle is added on top of that. Yeah. Um, my question is, would you be able to make those data publicly available? Because I am actually working on rare diseases. You can only, you, you're lucky you can get thousands uh, subjects, but you have a 10,000, you know, 100,000. That would be great. You can make the data available for people like we work in the cardiovascular disease. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Yeah, so all the um, work that I described, much of the work I described is based on UK Biobank data, which is publicly available. And then the models that we've used to, in terms of the weights and the SNPs that go into each of the scores, those are all publicly available as well. I said last question, but since when Arius came to the microphone, this really is the last question. So yes, when? Um, is C-reactive protein and other methods, other uh, manifestations of inflammation independent variables in the production of a myocardial infarction? Yes. So if you added CRP into this, the model, it would be an independent it would be an independent variable. So it's not, it hasn't been shown in these, in these, um, in my plots, but yes, it would be. So it's capturing something slightly different from what else is, is, is happening. And, and, and just recently, um, there was, there's been some very good evidence that um, directly antagonizing inflammation with a monoclonal antibody against um, IL-1 beta called canakinumab uh, in a randomized controlled trial of patients who have already had a heart attack on optimal therapy for lipids, half of them got this monoclonal antibody that targets inflammation, one inflammatory protein, the other half got placebo, there was a reduction in clinical events. Um, really the first human evidence from an RCT perspective, randomized controlled trial perspective, showing that uh, targeting inflammation directly can make a difference. Well, this has been a wonderful presentation with a great discussion, and we can continue the discussion in the medical library, if you'd like, uh, with coffee and cookies. And I'm, please, let's thank our speaker, C. Katharisen, again.